Man, oh man, here we go, here we go. Last week, uh, Pastor Larry started our series, Out of Control. And if you weren't here, it was a great message. And uh, we're going to pick up today. If you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of everything. We're going to read from there, and then we're going to dive off from that scripture this morning. Last week, if you weren't here, Pastor Larry started out the series basically saying that you know, Jesus is the greatest example of someone who lived their life out of control because he allowed God the Father to be in control of everything that happened and took, took place. And so he submitted his will and his life to whatever and gave all control to God the Father. Amen. And so that's a great example that he preached on for us to give God control in our life as well. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen? And so this is our uh, scripture we're going to dive off from here this morning. But let's just pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your spirit in this place. And Lord, I thank you that you helped me to teach this message to your people today. Father God, those sitting here and those watching online, Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name that you speak through the computers that they're watching on. You speak in this auditorium right now, Father, that you cause us, Father God, to grow closer to you and higher to you, that it bring revelation, impartation, and freedom to people today. And I thank you for it and declare it in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, Pastor Jennifer and I were gone uh, last week, as, and uh, we got some great great uh, family time and little vacation there. And so we're glad to be back and, and just going for it. But uh, today, the title of my message is, Who's in Charge? Say, Who's in Charge? Now, don't look at your husband right there. But uh, who's in charge is a, is a key question. Because if I asked everybody in this place who's in charge, everybody probably would say, well, you know, the obvious answer is God's in charge. But here's the, here's the true fact. The true fact is, is that God is not actually in charge in most of our lives, even though we know the proper and the correct answer is to say, well, God's in charge. Because as soon as you operate by fear or doubt or you say, man, I'm sure worried about that, then you're actually in charge. God's not in charge. As soon as you start thinking about, well, I just don't know if I have enough money to, to pay tithes this month, well, then you're actually in charge. God's not in charge. Well, I just don't know if we should do this. I just, man, I just don't know my teenagers. Well, then you're actually in charge. God's not in charge. And so we have to remember sometimes, even though we know the right thing to say, God's in charge, sometimes not in charge. And so sometimes people, even those who've maybe been rejected in life or you've got hurts in your life and stuff like that, sometimes people who've been rejected or hurt in their life, sometimes they take control. Even though they know God's supposed to be in control, they take control so that they're not hurt or somebody doesn't come and hurt them again. And they take control of situations and atmospheres and homes and classrooms and churches and businesses and all kinds of places because they don't want to be hurt or rejected. So they take control even though they know God's God's supposed to be in control. Amen? And so I don't know if you're like first service. They were real quiet and listening real good. But I, my goal is today to, uh, to get you set free of some things. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. If you listen real close today, this could be a revolutionary message in your life. And I know every Sunday we say that. But I really mean it today. Okay? And uh, I, I really do. I, I believe if you really, if you really pay close attention to what the Bible says and what I'm going to share with you today, uh, it'll, it'll bring freedom to, to a lot of people in this place. Now, I looked up the word control because if our series is called Out of Control, we need to find out what control is. And control, according to the dictionary, is to exercise restraint or direction over, dominate, and command. Or it is the act of power, act or power, of controlling, regulation, domination, or command. That's what control is. Now that word domination uh, kind of jumped out at me when I saw that the thing control there. So let's go back to our scripture. Let's read this again. And there's some things I want to point out to us. It says, and God said, let us make man 
in our image. Now he's talking about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit when he says our, all right? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creepy thing. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and over everything that creeps and moves on the earth. Now, I want to point out to you uh, really quickly about, it says there, let them have dominion, right? Let them. So them is talking about you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but has anybody ever been to... uh, Ever been to the zoo, San Diego Zoo, or LA Zoo, or something like that? Any, any zoo people? Not that you're a zoo person, but uh, anybody ever been to the circus? Been to a circus? All right. How many have never been to a circus? Wow, wow. Well, the next time it pulls up in our parking lot, we'll make sure to get you a ticket when the circus comes to town. Uh, actually, on a weekly basis, if you just come by, the circus is always happening out here in the front parking lot. But, um, but, <laughs> sorry, but. Uh, when you go to the circus, there's a really, really large animal, and it's gray. Anybody know what it is? An elephant. Has anybody noticed, like me, that when you go and you see the elephant, that they are tied up by a little rope, and they're to a stake, and that elephant does not move from that location? Has anybody ever observed that and seen that? All right. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I often have thought, how in the world is that little rope keeping that elephant tied up because it is so powerful that elephant could just move its leg like that and just break that rope just just like that I mean because if you've ever seen them just mow through the jungle I mean they just trample stuff so there's no way that that little rope can keep that elephant bound well I did a little research on that and found out that the reason that elephants are really like that is because uh, when they're tied up at the circus and they got them on this little rope it didn't start out that way. It started out when they were baby elephants. And when they were baby elephants, they tied them up with chain. And they would take the chain and they would wrap it around the ankle or the hoof of the baby elephants. And then they would tie that chain to a concrete stake, steel stake in the ground. So when the baby elephant would try to escape and get away, it would realize that it couldn't do it. And it would fight and it would struggle to try to get away. But it's bound because the chain and the concrete stake and the steel, steel pipe that's holding it down, it is stronger than the baby elephant at that time. And then there comes a moment in time when the elephant, the baby elephant, actually begins to stop trying to get away. When the trainer realizes that, they take the chain off and they exchange the chain with the piece of rope. And for the next 20, 30, or 40 years of that elephant's life, any time that it is bound by this little rope, it thinks there's no way of escape in its mind. In its mind, it knows that when I'm tied up, I can't get away. And from childbirth, from when the th- childbirth, from elephant birth, <laughs> from when the baby's born, that little elephant, uh, it, it is trained that it cannot get away when it is bound. And it can fight, and it can fight, and it can fight, and it'll never get away. So even though physically as this thing grows into this huge elephant, and it has way more power to break this little rope that keeps it bound, it thinks in its mind, I cannot be free. It thinks in its mind, I'm I'm bound to this rope. I I, I cannot move. I cannot be free. And I think it's interesting because really... In, you know, in the rope case or like that, it's in charge of the elephant. And in its mind, the elephant makes a decision that it, it, it decides that the power of the rope has more power than it does. The power of what it's bound to has more power than it does. And um, the sad thing is, is that many of us sitting here today in our lives, we're kind of like, we're kind of like the elephant. That we have been bound to things in our life that we have tried to break free from, but it has had a strong hold on us, until the point that we think in our mind that we cannot be free. 
And even though we're just held on by this little rope, and sometimes it comes through the form of addictions and bondages and habits, we think we can never actually be set free because we don't have the power to walk free or to be free. But we actually have the power of God in us and on us to overcome everything in life. Amen? But in our mind, in our intellect, we think we're bound just like that elephant. Just like the elephant thinks in its mind, I can't be free when this little rope is hanging on to it. Some of us in this place think that we cannot be free from things that have had us bound for years. We've actually lost hope on being free. Now, I want to speak to you. Look at me again. I want to speak to you. If you've ever struggled with an addiction to cocaine, if you've ever struggled with an addiction to marijuana, Who'd you marry? Marry Juana. Who, if you've ever struggled with an addiction to alcohol or whiskey or abusive alcohol or mix, whatever, or if you've ever struggled with habitual lying, if you've ever struggled with habitual gossip, if you've ever struggled with uh, soap operas that you can't get free from, if you've ever, if you've ever struggled from, from, from different things that has had you bound, then today I need you to listen very closely and say, well, Pastor Troy, I don't have any of those. Well, you got something. Everybody got something. It may not be cocaine. It may not be marijuana. <laughs> it may not be alcohol, but it, it might be something. Something has had you bound. Some of you, it might be Facebook and Instagram. Like while I've been talking, you've actually been on it because you're so addicted to it. Amen. Amen. So I want to help you see some things today. So let's go back to our scripture, Genesis chapter 1. Now the reason I, I, I say all that is I, I want you to get the visual of, of the elephant and how it's bound. And I want you to hear and get clear understanding of the scripture we're going to say. Now if you listen real close, you'll see some things. So let's go back. Then God said, let us have, make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, notice he's talking about our, our image and our likeness. And then the, the, the verbiage change and it goes, let them. Let them. Who's them? Them is who he's creating. Let them have dominion. Say dominion, dominion. Which is another word for control. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and everything creeps on the earth. So God created man in our own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Them who's supposed to have dominion. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue so it. Have dominion. Over the fish and sea, over the birds of the air, over everything that moves on the earth, on the earth. Everything, anything living on the earth, we're supposed to have dominion over. Do you see that? So the first thing he gives them is an identity, which is the image that they're supposed to be in. The, 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 the second thing he gives them is, his, is the assignment, which is the dominion they're supposed to have. So the first thing is, hey, they need to know what their identity is, which is our image. So your identity, the reason people fall into addictions is because they don't understand who their, what their identity is. And the reason people stay in that is because they don't realize who their identity is. So once you know who you are, then you have to know what your purpose is and your assignment is, is to have dominion. God's original purpose for man was to rule and have dominion on the earth. Amen. So at our Bible school on uh, Tuesday night, we had a friend, uh, friend here, Sean Kilty, and he said this, and, 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 and I, I thought, I thought it, was, it was really good. He said, I wonder how come people are trying to get to heaven when God's assignment for us was to come to the earth. Everybody's trying to get out and get to heaven or, or someday when I go to heaven and our goal is to get to heaven when actually God called us to have rule and dominion while on the earth and that this is where he called us and he goes, there's no one in heaven that needs saved. There's no one in heaven that needs healed. There's no one in heaven that needs joy. So our assignment is on the earth. So we need to focus on, hey, we actually have something to do and we're supposed to have dominion and rule and reign while we're on the earth, the place that God actually designed us to be at. So let's just do it right here and quit trying to get to heaven. Boop. Y'all get that? So the word image, notice it says, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. The word image is from the word E-I-K-O-N, icon, econ. It denotes two ideas of number one, representation, and number two, manifestation. So let us make man in our image our representation. Let us make man in our image our manifestation. So we are the representation of God on the earth, and we are his manifestation on the earth. So that's who you are. That's your identity. So you need to understand that you are a representative of heaven made in the image and likeness of God on the earth to manifest his glory. That's who you are. 
Now, I'm just going to let you know first service was responding a lot more than you are right now. So you need to kick it up a notch, people. Come on. Amen? Are you getting this? Now, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Are you ready? Not really challenge you. I just want some, I want some light bulbs to go on, okay? All the way in the back. Everybody in the back, listen real close. Now, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 2. Now, if you get this, this will be revelation. This will be life-changing to you. Okay, you got to get this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Are you ready? And the Lord God, now let me ask you this. Let's see how many know. How many know what we were made from? What God made us from? Anybody? Dirt. All right, I heard one dirt comment. Anybody agree with the dirt comment? Some of you don't know. You're not going to raise your hand whatsoever. Okay, let me read the Bible to you. All right, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay, so if you didn't know how, where you came from, there it is right there. All right, we didn't come from little, little monkeys. All right? Uh, okay. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, this is the greatest CPR experience in history, the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now, if I was teaching this in kids' ministry, I would take the Play-Doh that they play with, and I would have them shape a little man, and then I'd have little kids, let's start blowing. <laughs> See if these little guys come, come to life on the table. That would be really fun, wouldn't it, in kids' ministry? Form them of the dust of the ground. So we were made from what? The what? Okay, now, go with me down to verse 19. Out of the what? Ground. Is it on screen yet? Out of the, where'd it go? Genesis, hey, there we go. Out of the? The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So not only did God take us and create us out of the ground of the dust, he also created every living creature out of the ground. Now here's something really crazy and cool. He did not name them. Adam did. Adam named every creature. That gives us a glimpse of the possibility of the intellectual capacity that you and I have as a human being if we're tapped into the supernatural realm of God, into the spirit of God, that we can operate at a level that Adam named every creature on the planet after not even going to school. He did not have a doctorate from Harvard on animal names. He was just the first human ever and he named them and he came up with hippopotamus he named them amen isn't that amazing now i just wanted you to see that that not only were we created from the ground but the beasts were created from the ground and then we know that every plant came up from the earth or the ground so everything that was created on the earth came from the dust or the ground can you see that it's important that you see that in order to get the revelation today okay so everything came from that. Now, here's the question. Who's in charge? Yes, God is in charge, but people generally don't admit it. Now, I'm, I want to speak to you really, really real right now. Now, everybody in here, first of all, nobody judges anybody, and we're all family. We're just here to be free, and that's the whole point of Jesus, that he came to set people free, that they're no longer captive but bound, or not bound, amen? And so that's the point. So if you've ever struggled with addictions, or maybe currently are, then I'm believing that this message will give you some revelation of how you can be free from that. Because I don't know anybody that really wants to be bound or in slavery to a drug or a habit. Most of them say, I just don't know how to kick this. I just don't know how to get free of this. Man, I know it's wrong, but I just, I just can't. I just have to. That's the verbiage that people will use when it comes to doing lines or marijuana or alcohol or beer or lying or I just have to watch this show or whatever it is. It, it's, it's an addiction. It's a habit. So I want to show you some things in the Word of God because I want you to see that everything came from the ground. Right? Did you come from the ground? Yes, absolutely. No, I came from my mama. Well, yeah, okay. All right. Number one, I did a little research, whiskey. Whiskey is a type of distilled alcoholic beverage made from fermented grain mash 
various grains which may be malted or used for different varieties, including barley, corn, maize, rye, and wheat. Whiskey is typically aged in wooden casks, generally made of charred white oak. Beer. Beer is made from four basic ingredients. Some of you probably don't need me to tell you. You have a distillery in your basement, but I'm just going to say it for those who don't know. Beer is made from four basic ingredients, barley, water, hops, and yeast. The basic idea is to extract sugars from grains, usually barley, so that the yeast can turn it into alcohol and CO2, creating beer. The brewing process starts with grains, usually barley, although sometimes wheat, rye, or other such things. Cocaine is a highly addictive, stimulative drug that is manufactured from the leaves of the coca plant. Cocaine, that's where it comes from, the coca plant. Tobacco, very addictive, is a product prepared from the leaves of the tobacco plant by curing them. Dried tobacco leaves are mainly smoked in cigarettes, cigars, pipe tobacco, and flavored shisha tobacco. They are also consumed as snuff, chewing tobacco, and dipping tobacco. Second Peter 2.19 says, For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. In the NIV. In the Living Bible, it says, For a man is a slave to whatever controls him. So we say we're in control. Or we say that God is in control. Or I have this addictive behavior, but I can control it. When in actual reality, you are actually enslaved to it. The scripture says, for a man is a slave to whatever controls him. For a man is a slave, just like an elephant, to whatever controls him. Even though we're free and we're alive and we look like we're free, we're actually can't move forward with God. Can't move forward with our purpose. Because the very thing that we know we're not supposed to be doing and we hate that we actually do, that some people don't even know that we do, keeps us bound from our purpose and our destiny. And we sometimes wonder why we're not blessed. And we sometimes wonder why we're not free. And we sometimes wonder why our marriage struggles. And we sometimes wonder why our finances struggle. And we sometimes wonder why certain things happen for some people but not others. And it's because sometimes we have not become free of the things in our life. Amen? Now... I want you to catch something here. What are we made from? Ground, dust, dirt. Animals are made from? Ground, dust, dirt. Plants are made from and come from? Ground, dust, the earth, right? So God says, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them, them, man, humanity, have dominion. Let them have dominion over everything that's on the earth. The problem is, even though you and I were designed by God to have dominion or control over everything on the earth, the problem is, is that some of us in this place are actually being controlled by the very thing that we're supposed to have dominion over. We are controlled by the coca plant. We are controlled by wheat and barley and hops. We are controlled by the tobacco plant. Everything that I listed that is an addictive behavior that people struggle with, getting free from cigarettes, getting free from cocaine, getting free from alcohol, getting free from, from all these things, plus all the things that are not listed, are the plants. They all come from plants, the things that come from the earth. The very thing that God told man you're supposed to have dominion over actually has dominion over us. So when I say, God, who's in control, and you say, God, no, he's not. When I say, who's in control, and you say, me, no, you're not. Who's actually in control of your life? The coca plant. Who's actually in control? Wheat. Who's actually in control? Things that come from the earth that human beings take to make an alcoholic beverage or drink or addictive thing that comes from the very earth that we're supposed to have dominion over, we actually are being dominated by. People are being dominated by plants. And as a man, that should be an insult. That your life is dominated by a leaf. You think your wife's dominated? No, the leaf is dominating you. 
The plants in your basement are dominating you. Who's in charge? The plants. See, it's the plants. actually have us bound and then we try to do our purpose for God I know but I got that oh, man, nobody knows but dang it and it's all about having a relationship with him but because you know he knows what you're bound to you want to be free so you can fulfill your purpose and destiny but until you're actually free from it you know you don't hear him clearly even though you know you're supposed to come to church and you read the Bible and you do all these things, and it's all this stuff that you, you look good on the outside, but privately on the inside, you know that you're like an elephant. And you've been trying to break free for years from the same habit. Years. And you come to church and you worship and you lift your hands and you serve in church, and then privately, you're not free. The very thing that you and I are supposed to be dominating over, it's dominating us. And in some cases, it's not a plant. It can be lying or gossip or too much television. But it's addictive. You can't be free of it. Like if you don't watch a show, you like freak out. It's not good. If you miss an episode, if you miss an episode, your life is like unfulfilled. <laughs> You're laughing because you, see, you, you hear how sick and demented and weird that is. But that's how people live. Some of you in this place. If you don't post every moment and everything that your family's doing and going through. <laughs> let me just tell you, some of your lives aren't that interesting. Nobody really needs to know. <laughs> I mean, I don't really care that your dog just went to the bathroom. I really don't care. Come on. See, addictions and behaviors like that are really a lack of identity of knowing who you are in Christ. But because we've come from religion many times, we've never learned who we are in Christ. Therefore, we just live a religious Christianity rather than a powerful Christianity. Because what we think, just like the elephant, determines whether we're free. And if the elephant was trained when it was a child that you're bound and you can't be free, even though you've been raised in a certain church or denomination and you've come out and you now are a follower of Jesus Christ, some of your thinking is still bound to that old way of thinking. And you can't experience the true freedom in Christ because you've been taught certain things. And God needs to let you know that you can be totally free and he wants to have a relationship with you. Amen? Now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start landing the plane. Now, it doesn't do me any good to instruct you and show you that you're supposed to have dominion. It doesn't do me any good to share with you that we have been uh, in addictive behaviors to, to things that have been dominating us, that we're supposed to be dominating if I don't tell you how to get free. So here we go. Are you ready? So if this, any of these things that I've mentioned hit home with you, then pay attention. So how do we identify a controlling habit? Number one, a controlling habit is something you find yourself doing even though it is destructive, either physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, or spiritually. Or you consistently do something you wish you wouldn't do, but you find yourself doing. That's how you recognize a controlling habit. Consistently doing something you wish you wouldn't do, but you find yourself continually doing. Paul talks about that. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says this. The apostle Paul wrote, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In other words, Jesus came to set us free, but it says we can be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. In other words, you were free, and then you're, you do good for about three months, and then you fall back into it, and you put this chain or this rope back on you again, and you think you're bound again. You have been free by Christ Jesus. He paid the price totally and completely. So the only thing that puts you back in bondage is your own thinking, just like the elephant. 
The elephant thinks it's bound every time this rope gets put around it. But Jesus came to set you free the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time. You've been free. So don't put your life and your thinking back that you're bound again. When you have been set free, you might have a relapse or a setback, but don't let your setback hold you back from the thing that God has for you. Amen? You need to move forward in Him. The problem is some of us in this place have tried to be set free, and we don't even have the will to fight because the habit or the addiction has broken your will. And you've tried so many things. You've tried AA. You've tried everything. And it sets you free for a while. And you get free for a while. But then you fall back into it. How do I know this? Because I've done this. There's nobody in this room that has not fallen victim to some habit or thing that controls you. And you can't get free of it. And you don't want to be bound to it. But you keep falling back. So there's a process of how you can take dominion back. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified, here's the key, the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So Genesis 5 right here at verse 22 says that we have to have self-control. Now, you cannot have self-control because most of us live out of control. You cannot have self-control unless God is actually in control. Then you can control yourself. Otherwise, you live your life by the flesh. And you just let this little baby do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, however much it wants. And you have no self-control. And most people say, well, I, I can stop drinking any time. Can you? Or is it out of control? You don't have any self-control because that thing rules you. That wheat rules you. Barley rules you. You have no dominion over it. You can't stop it whenever you want. Budweiser rules you. Coors rules you. You don't have your life, they do. Jack Daniels rules you. Marlboro Lights rule you. Is that a cigarette? Is that good? It rules you. But it doesn't have to, and it's not supposed to. You were created by God to have dominion and authority. If we live in the Spirit, we'll also walk in the Spirit. It says you have to crucify the flesh. So the flesh is the thing that is the problem that gets in the way. So we have to, in the last scripture, James chapter 4, verse 7. Here is the remedy. Are you ready for the remedy? I didn't make it up. God did. Because <laughs> he created all of these things from the earth, and he created you from the earth, so I bet you he knows how to you can be set free from the things that he made. Right? How many know that really cocaine and mar- marijuana and all that kind of stuff, alcohol is really a perversion of God's intention? See, some people smoke marijuana or whatever to get high. You can get so high on the Holy Ghost that you feel like you're floating. But if you've never gone there, that's because you don't think you can go there. It's a mind thing. You've limited yourself. Or you think you might be getting a little bit too weird like one of those crazy Christians if you do that. What's more weird? Someone dominated by a plant or someone going with God? Just made that one up. James 4, 7, are you there? Therefore... Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Pretty simple. Here's the problem. We don't do it the way God says to do it. See, here's the whole thing. If you have a relationship with God, that's why sometimes, I'll just be honest with you, I struggle sometimes with some of our worship. Because if we're really in love with God, if we're really a follower of Jesus Christ, then I would, according to the Bible, there should be some outward expression that you're in love with him. So sometimes I'm like, do they really love God? Because they don't look like it. Are they really saved? Because they don't really look like it. Would they be found guilty in a court of worshiping Jesus? Because I don't think so. Like, who are you to judge my worship? I'm just saying what the Bible says is what we're supposed to look like and how we're supposed to follow him. If we're really in love with, if you're in love with somebody, if you're in love with your wife, people know it. If you're in love with your kids, people know it. 
If you're in love with Jesus, people should not wonder. Amen? When you got baptized, that was like putting on the wedding ring. Follower of Christ. So it says, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Well, the problem is, is most people go to step two first, which is resist the devil. Man, I can't believe it. I just, man, I was doing so good. I was, I was, I was clean for three months. Dang it. And then I messed up. In, the, in Jesus' name, devil, I come against you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, I come against the addiction to alcohol. Jesus' name, I come against that addiction to lying. In Jesus' name, I come against whatever addiction or whatever habit that's controlling you and you don't like doing that you do. So we go to step two. The problem is we're still living in the flesh. You have to do step one first. Step one says, therefore, submit to God. What does that mean? That means that you are no longer in control, that you have given Him control. Therefore, you live your life out of your own control because you have submitted it to God. And when you submit to God, then you say, God, I repent of my addictive behaviors. God, I repent of letting these plants have dominion over me. God, I repent of disappointing you, even though you can't really disappoint God. God, I repent of whatever it is in your life that you need to repent of. And you say, God, I want you to take control of my life. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to listen to your voice. My life is yours. I die to myself. That's what the Bible says. And when you submit to God, then when the devil comes to try to bind you up again, and he goes, hey, bro. It's just natural. I don't know. Hey, bro, I got some stuff. I got some stuff. We're going to the bar. You want to come? You're going to have some cervezas? Come on. Because you've submitted your life to God, you don't resist the people that are inviting you, but you resist the temptations and the addictions and the habits that have controlled you, the plants that have dominated you. And because you are now submitting to God, you live your life by what He says, not what your flesh wants. And if His Word says to stay free of these things and no longer be controlled, but you have self-control, and you know that this affects you, then you say no, and you resist the devil. And then step three happens. He sticks around. He flees from you. And so when you submit your life to God and you resist the devil from these addictive patterns and behaviors, and he's very sneaky because all of a sudden you think you're free from, the, from alcohol or being addicted to beer or whatever that is, and then all of a sudden you just start, ah, one here, one there, and all of a sudden it starts getting out. He's very sneaky. He's very sly. You've got to watch him because you think you're in control, and he's setting you up. You've got to watch him. He's sneaky. And so then you submit to God, you resist the devil, and it says, and he flees. And he doesn't just kind of like take off like this. He flees and he runs because he knows that you now understand your identity, who you are in Christ, and that you actually do have the power to break the rope in your life. You actually do have the power because you're no longer ruled like an elephant who does not have any insight to who he is and the power that he has. You actually understand that you have the power of God on the inside of you and upon you, and you can break free from that thing in your life. You're no longer bound to that. You can break free from that. And if the devil comes and puts it on you, and you fall one time, you don't have to stay bound. You're not like the elephant. You are free because Jesus already set you free. You have dominion over that thing and you can walk free in your life from addictions and behaviors in your life. You can be free and you can live your life out of control, giving God control because you did step number one, which is submit to God. It all comes through number one, submitting to God. Because if you submit to your flesh, then you can't really resist the devil. If you submit to your flesh and everything it wants all the time, it's going to rule you, you're going to fall, and the plants are going to dominate you. 
But we're not supposed to live our life by the flesh. We're supposed to live our life by the Spirit. We're supposed to be Spirit-led believers who know who they are in Christ and dominate in victory in every area of our life. You rule and reign in life. The devil does not dominate you. Nothing dominates you. You have victory because Jesus paid the price for you to walk in that victory. He has given you the keys to hell and the grave, and you can walk free in life. You can be prosperous in everything and in every way.